Welcome back to Tactical Accounts. Today we'll go over four scopes to buy used for your 22 LR rifle. This video is aimed at beginners, anybody who is new to guns, and anybody who is new to scopes in particular. So if you're, if you know what parallax is, difference between MOA or half inch per hundred adjustments, things like that, this is just a fun video to watch, but if you don't know what those things are, this video might teach you a few things. And this video might sort of serve as a buyer's guide. Even if you don't buy any of these four scopes, there might be things that you learn today that you can look for when making your next purchase. The first scope is the cheapest one on the list, and it's also the first Nikon today. It is a three to nine pro staff rimfire with a BDC reticle. Uh, this one was purchased a good four or five years ago for right around a hundred bucks at Cabela's on Black Friday. Um, it came with a box of some bulk 22, I think it was federal, and that was a time when ammo was in short supply. Um, the last time before today, it was in short supply. Today, I'd say the scope is probably a $50 scope. That's what I would pay for it if I was buying a used. And I think something to consider is that Nikon has left the scope market recently, I think within the past year. So warranty claims might be a little bit shaky on it. So you're just kind of buying it and if it breaks, I would just consider that cost of doing business kind of thing. So why this one specifically? Well, it's very, uh, it's very light. It's right around 13 ounces. Part of it is due to it being a one inch main tube right here. Uh, this is the smallest one typically used. The reticle, it's a BDC reticle that's supposed to be calibrated for 22, but in uh, our experience, it doesn't really work all that well. It's still better than just a regular crosshair reticle, but you'll just have to figure out what it lines up to with your low specifically. It probably won't line up to what it says um, in the scope manual. We have shot this American as well as a couple other ones up to 300 yards with the same scope. So it's definitely capable to reach out to uh, some kind of longer distances for 22. It's just not ideal. So the turrets are capped, as you can see, just plastic screw on caps. The turrets are pretty nice. These are actually half inch at, or quarter inch, excuse me, at 50 yards. They're not an MOA. Yeah, um, is that enough, you know, of a difference to make a difference? Probably not, but that is something to note. These are quick reset. So if you change the zero, you just lift up and set, up to, set it to zero again. The clicks are actually surprisingly nice. Very tactile. Same for the one ditch knob right here. There is obviously no zero stop. And elevation wise, I don't have the manual with me, but from what I recall, up to 300, you're maxing out the elevation turret using what you have in the reticle and you still might be holding off kind of into space. So it's not ideal, but it's, it's doable. The one thing to also know is that when you go up in elevation, the turret does not move up and down it stays at the same height, so you can't tell how many revs you've gotten up or down. You just have to remember or re zero after every time. So as you can see, there are some limitations to what the scope can do along a range, but it makes up for those things and being again light. Minification range three to nine, it's kind of the typical hunting scope. So if you're using this for like pest control or just a general plinking gun, it's, it's a great scope, it's held zero for years now. So no problems there. Um, now, why is this called the rimfire model? Part of it is the reticle, but part of it is the parallax, which is set at 50 yards on the rimfire model. They're typically set at 100 on the center fire models. So what's parallax? Um, it's sometimes referred to as side focus, 
but that is more of a byproduct of what adjusting parallax does. What you're actually doing is you're putting the reticle at the same plane as your target. So in picking um, which model you want, figure out what distances you're most likely to shoot at. Uh, small game and backyard plinking, probably the Rimfido model. With the closer parallax, it still won't be a deal for those 20, 25 yard shots, but it's better than 100 yard parallax. If you're gonna be shooting, you know, 100 yard groups or trying to stretch out to two, 300 yards, just go with the regular model, not the Rimfire. Um, and that they'll have the parallax at 100 yards. The, the, the radical is no really no concern because I don't think it'll line up no matter which model you get. Cool, all right, another Nikon product next. This one is the Nikon Black FX 1000 4 to 16 power. Uh, this one is a first focal plane scope with a mill radical and this one is not eliminated. Uh, they do offer this model with a illuminate reticle as well as an MOA reticle, if that's your thing. So what does uh, first focal plane mean? All the scopes from here on out will be first focal plane. So basically when you're adjusting the, the zoom here, the reticle will change size. So in here, you'll have hash marks, one mil, two mil. So if you're looking at a target down range that's one mil high or one, one mil tall, it'll stay one mil tall through the whole range from 16 to four power, it'll always be one mil. What it also means that if you're trying to use holdovers to shoot a distance at 400 yards, let's say your hold is three mils, that three mils will be accurate at whatever power you're at. In the three to nine that we talked about, the reticle is meant to be used at maximum power, which is fine because you'd probably be shooting at nine power at a longer range. Just be aware that some scopes, I know some of the Vortex, I think HST Gen 1s, like the six to 24, had a reticle that was useful at like 20 power or something. There's no way you're going to be able to know specifically what power you're on. There's no detents on, on the zoom level. Nice. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So with Nikon getting out of the scope business, um, these were on closeout. I bought this one for 360 with tax and shipping. But I think as of today, you can still find some new ones on closeout, but they're closer to $500. I'm not really sure why they've gone up in price. I think 500 bucks, you can get a used Gen 2 PST, which I think is a better scope than this. There's a couple of small differences and I think that scope just, it's, it's worth the money especially considering that Vortex is still in business and they'll honor the lifetime warranty. I think used, I'm not sure I would pay more than 300 bucks for it if it's in really good shape. And I think at that price, it's a really good deal. So on this, you do have an adjustable parallax. So the parallax goes down to 50 yards and then it's adjustable all the way out to infinity, like all scopes. It's very smooth, it's nice. It's not the best parallax out there. There are some newer scopes that go down to like 10 yards, which is great for room fire. This scope has a 30 millimeter main tube. That matters because the bigger the tube, the more elevation adjustment you typically get. Speaking of elevation adjustments, the 4 to 16 has more than the 6 to 24, which is the reason why I went with the 4 to 16. I don't think I need more magnification to do what I, I want to do with this scope. The reticle is a mil reticle, like I mentioned, you get eight mils of elevation in the reticle itself. The turrets have 10 mils per rev 
So especially on a 22, it's, it's nice because you're making fewer rotations to go up. As you can see, the whole turret moves up as you go up and down, and you can tell which rev you're on. Um, this scope does have a zero stop as well, which you can adjust. So if you're shooting at further distances, you, you can, before you go home for a day, you know how far to go back. The turrets are nice and audible. They're not the best turrets. We'll talk about a couple, next scope has great turrets. But I typically, when you have 10 mils versus five mils per rev, the clicks are a little bit closer and they get a little bit more mushy. But I don't think um, this is, these are bad. They're just not the greatest. One thing to know is that this windage knob sticks out quite a bit and it can be a little bit of a pain to charge the gun. I've rubbed some skin off my uh, knuckles quite a few times, especially because this is very sharp. So I have a charging handle waiting to go in. Hopefully that gets a little bit further out, but it's just something that you have to deal with. The last scope we'll talk about um, has a uh, locking when this turret, which is very nice. Image, wi image quality wise, it's fine. I think image quality is a little bit overstated in the reviews. I think there's a lot of other qualities they talk about with the scope um, before we get to image quality. I, I think it's fine. Nothing to write home about, nothing that would keep you from hitting a target either though. I think the only thing that's missing from the scope is the parallax that will go down to at least 25 yards when you're using it on a 22. Um, beyond that, I think it has everything you'd want in a Precision 22 scope uh, if you're on a limited budget. And if you ever get sick of it, this is a perfect scope for a center fire bolt action rifle, or even if you want to put on a more of like a Precision AR, AR-10 or anything like that. It's a very versatile scope. Next up is the 2.5-10 Gen 1 Vortex PST. So this one we have a box. This one will be going on a Brownells 1022 build. And I think I'll, I'll get into why this scope specifically for that build. You might be a little surprised that a 10 power scope is going to go on a Precision 22. But we'll talk about that in a second. Vortex does have the Gen 2 model out now, which does have some improvements over this scope, but they come obviously at a higher cost and they're heavier. I think this scope still has, uh, has its place and the MMP-10 that you guys see all over this channel has had a 2.5 to 10 PST on it for years now without any issues, um, running thousands of rounds of Russia's finest steel cage through it. Uh, going all over the country and it's held up great. And so I think on a 22 is more than capable. On the second hand market, you're looking at about $400, um, which is obviously more than that Nikon, which is a newer model, but you're covered under Vortex's warranty you can run this thing over with the truck, they'll cover it, and I think that's a huge, huge plus. So why this one specifically? Well, it's very light considering the features. The Nikon that we looked at first, the three to nine was I think 13 or 14 ounces. This one's 19. You're getting a wider magnification range, four X, two and a half to 10, that was three to nine. And you're getting a 30 millimeter main tube, which as I said, you get more elevation more election adjustments. The reticle, you're getting nine mils to use for holdovers, uh, 30 MOA, that'll get you pretty far. Uh, 100 yard zero, standard velocity load. You can use just, just the reticle to get to right around 250 yards. And if you, you know, shooting even a reduced size IP6, 10 power is plenty to get you there. I don't think 
you need to go to you know a 16 or 20 25 power scope just because you're building a precision gun and this is going on a 1022 with a bull barrel and the brown is brownells receiver down the road there are times where more magnification is better but you don't always need it um, when i'm shooting my six millimeter creedmoor at our club matches that go out to 600 yards i'm typically at 12 to 15 power and that's again shooting two three moi targets so i don't get hung up on how much magnification the scope has uh, the only times uh, i'm really cranking up my magnification is i'm shooting for groups or zero in the gun but for hunting small game or just plinking 10 power is uh, more than enough additionally typically the lower the magnification of a scope the more elevation adjustments you're going to get that's why i went with the 4 to 16 9 10 over the 6 to 24 and it's also in play with the vortex models this one has 25 mils of elevation adjustments while the 6 to 24 has 19 mils now you might not need all of the elevation on the center fire rifle but uh, if you're trying to stretch out a 1022 or 22 in general you're you'll be looking for those extra six mils pretty quickly the turrets on this thing are great they're very very audible Um, part of it has to do with the fact that they are five mils per rotation. They're very audible. The clicks are spaced apart quite a bit. You're never going to be kind of confused as to which, what you're, what you dialed into the scope. Same with the windage. Parallax, 35 yards, nice and smooth. The illuminator reticle has off positions in between does not go to 11, only 10. And then you have a nice smooth power ring here with a little fiber optic to show you where you're at. And then you get the same on the elevation. It lines up very, very well to the mark right there. And again, this one does go up as you're traveling up and down is very nice and the zero stop take the elevation cap off and you get a pack of these shims it's not the best zero stop but it does work i did have a cabela's brand first focal plane scope i bought it for like 200 bucks um it's in some of my 1022 videos and i can't over it overemphasize how important the zero stop is and the fact that the turret goes up and down. I know it might seem silly that I'm harping on that, but when you're constantly moving back and forth between different distances, it gets old really quick to have to keep track of what rev you're on. Or if you forget, you basically have to re-zero the gun again. Um, and it's, it's just a huge, huge pain in the ass. And I sold that scope and I got that Nikon. Really, that was a huge reason why. Parallax is almost there, 35 yards is perfect, almost perfect for a 22. So that's a really good option as well. And finally, it's the Bushnell HDMR2 uh, with the Horus H59 reticle. Uh, this one has been on my PRS rifles, uh, first on my 700, now it's on my six Creedmoor here. I think if I ever move to a different scope, I might keep this one for my 22. And I've had this one for over three years at this point, and I've shot it in, a, in, my, in our club matches, first on a 308 and a 700, and now on this, and has never given me any issues. So that's kind of on the reliability part of it. This one is also covered by lifetime warranty. Um, I honestly have not heard that much about Bushnell's customer service. I assume it's pretty good. I have never had to deal with them. This is the only Bushnell I have, and I have not had to send it back. This one is three and a half, to 21 and it's a 34 millimeter main tube so you can see it's kind of a chunky boy it's 37 ounces so that's like two of those viper psts so it's definitely a large heavy scope but it has the most elevation adjustment 
out of any of the scope today. It has 30 mils of internal adjustments in, in, the, in the turret. Parallax goes down to only 50, which is a little bit of a drawback. We're talking about 22s. And then really the biggest reason that this scope I think is on this list or I, why I decided to put it on this list is that the reticle is very, very unique. It's a reticle, the H59 by Horus, which you can get in Schmidt and Benders, Leupold, Bushnell. Um, I think Vortex offers it now in the Razors. It's a reticle that a company like Bushnell can pay for and they can use it in their scopes. And what's unique about it is that it, as you, again, first focal plane scope and as you go down in, in the power here, down to three and a half, the reticle just keeps expanding and expanding all the way down. Whereas most other reticles, I'm not gonna say all, but the Vortex and Nikons, like I said, they stop at nine mils in the, in the reticle. Here you get 38 mils at three and a half power. Now it's kind of hard to see, so you might have to have really good eyes to use that, but you do get 38 mils of elevation plus 30 in the reticle. So you can hit anything that you want with the 22, I think. Uh, if you want to mortar them, if you want to mortar some 22s at some ridiculously far targets, this might be a scope for you. The reticle itself is typically, I've heard three to $400 licensing fee per scope. Typically you're finding this reticle in more expensive scopes. Like I said, Vortexes, Schmidt and Benders, I'm not sure Night Force. I think Night Force might have a few horse reticles. I'm not sure if they have the H59. Either way, these are obviously kind of top tier brands. This one, they don't make anymore with the horse reticle, but I think it was around $1,200. Now, you see them for 800. I think mine being, you know, well used, might be 750, if that. So I think you're getting a lot, a lot of scope for that money. Like I said, before nice feature is that this turret locks so you're not knocking it by accident when you're moving around people typically don't dial in their their windage you zero in and you just hold from wind especially with this kind of reticle um, it also makes it kind of gets out of the way like i said in the 1022 when you're charging it it's very nice it does come with an integrated throw lever back here Zero stop is very, very nice, very firm. As you can see, you can't move it at all. Turrets are decent. I wouldn't say they're the best, but they're decent. Um, parallax is nice and smooth. The scope is also incredibly short. This has a This has a sunshade, as you can see, that is a very, very short scope. Looks almost kind of goofy. And that about will wrap it up for us today. I hope you guys learned something. If you have any questions, please post them down below. And uh, tune in for the Brownells precision build down there. We actually had the barrel just came in. Um, the parts kit, the receiver, we just need a stock and pretty much just put that thing together. So hopefully that, that those videos will be out soon. That's probably not before tax season.